Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mysteries Unlimited. Uh, I was checking the chat already, so I uh, uh, just want to welcome everybody to uh, another episode tonight. Uh, before we get started, I want to share some news with you. Uh, my uncle, uh, sadly, lost his battle with pancreatic cancer this past Saturday. Uh, we had the graveyard service and a funeral uh, this past uh, Wednesday. Uh, uh, that's something that uh, anybody who is familiar with cancer, pancreatic cancer, is like the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's what Patrick Swayze had, uh, and he was able to live and survive for uh, about a year or so. But he uh, ultimately it got him too. Uh, but it's you know it's been kind of sad and it's been hard on the family. We appreciate everybody who has. Uh, kept us in your thoughts and prayers and if you don't mind continue to pray for the family that uh, my uncle left behind uh, cancer is no joke uh, I would have liked to have seen uh, I'm not against helping other countries but uh, 40 billion dollars toward can towards cancer research could have probably went a long way but with that said uh, we want to go on to I think we got a good show tonight uh, I'm gonna go ahead and bring Leo in and we'll do uh, Maybe a test on his mic and make sure everything's working correctly. Hey, Leo, all I can see is the top of your head. Wake up, buddy. Don't go to sleep. <laughs> oh, you're getting closer. Now. Nah, there we go. I feel better already. <laughs> Are you all right tonight? Uh, I'm, I'm getting by. Getting by. Well, I know that feeling. Uh <laughs> yeah, I know you do. If anybody does, you do. Well, you know, the last two weeks, uh, my wife has been working a uh, a guy's vacation. So we've been getting up like, I don't know, a lot of times she gets up before I do, but usually two thirty, three o'clock in the morning. And, man, that'll wear you out. I, I'm getting too old for that, <laughs> that kind of deal, getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I know you guys end up doing that fairly often with the 2.30 thing, and man, I don't know how you do it. I couldn't handle that. Uh, I try to go to bed early. Usually, well, last night I went to bed a little bit at 9, about 9.30 or so, but when I'm in there, in the bedroom, usually I'll turn on the TV, and I'm, I'm a good hour, sometimes longer, uh, watching TV before I get back sleepy. But uh, I took a nap this afternoon, which I told you, I was talking to you earlier, and I said, oh, I'm going to take a nap before the show. Uh, I slept maybe an hour. Uh, got up and ate and washed my face and uh, best I can do I look like crap but I'm here <laughs> <laughs> it's been a rough week well we ain't we, neither one of us are pretty so they're not here for the looks no uh, <laughs> hopefully they're here for the information and for those who do not know uh, Leo and I have a combined uh, research uh, of 50 years combined years of field research and that doesn't mean we know everything. Uh, it means we've had a lot of experiences. Uh, we're still learning. There's still things for both of us to learn. Uh, but we do have some answers and some clues and some direction that we uh, we can help guide and direct people uh, toward truthful information, stuff we've experienced and we know about. I'm just checking the chat, guys. All right, Leo, do we want to start with uh, with your stuff tonight, or it depends on which what you want to get over with quicker? Because once we get on Patty, then that's gonna. Well, I uh, hopefully uh, I think Patty's gonna be a deep subject. I do have a bonus. Uh, I call it a folder. I put everything in a folder based on what we're talking about. Uh, I do have a bonus folder, which is just something a little short. If if we run out of time, I mean, if we you know run out of topics, we can go on that a little bit. Uh, if not, it's something that we can maybe do some other time. But well, I guess what we will do then, Leo, uh, we will start with topic number one, and uh, the topic is going to be uh, about Bigfoot uh, using hand tools. And me and Leo has talked about this some and. Leo's had a little more experience. Well, I'll say a lot more experience uh, with this type of a uh, thing than I than I have. But if you really think about it, I think uh, if if a Bigfoot is using a piece of wood or rock 
to make a tree knot, that is, in a sense, that is kind of a tool that it's using. Uh, and I would say there are probably territorial battles at times or fights that break out amongst Bigfoot. Uh, maybe even they cross with Bigfoot and Dogman fighting or whatever, but just let's just say two uh, male Bigfoot are in a fight to see who's going to be the dominant uh, one or who's going to have the area. Uh, it's it's not hard to think that they would pick up a rock or stick and just wallop the other guy, you know. Uh, in, in a sense, even though that's a weapon, it's still it's kind of a tool as well. Well, definitely anything that they, you know, would pick up and, and use for any type of assist, then it, it's, it's a tool. And, you know, people talk about if a Bigfoot and a bear got in a fight, I think Bigfoot would win because he has a thumb and he can grasp. Not only could he grasp with a bear, he could also grasp a rock or stick and just give him a good thud where a bear maybe couldn't do that. I would think by depending on the age, uh, but if we're talking about adults on both sides, uh, it wouldn't even last as long as what most people, I think that's one that people to put too much thought in unless they're talking, you know, a big grizzly or something. Right. But uh, I, I don't, I mean, I, look at the way the way that we're able to move that a bear can't and then add all that size and power to it. I, I would, I don't think it would even go as long as what most people. Yeah. Especially yeah. just a common black bear. Cause they're quite a bit smaller. Yeah. Anyway. That's, that's, that, that would be over rather quick for just a, just a black bear. Yeah. He, he gets thumped. <laughs> uh, this first picture we're going to show Leo, if I'm not mistaken, is that this, the photo where, uh, you took the picture of Carl, I believe. Uh, I think. Yeah, so that's the the root ball. That's where he would have been standing. So that's that's the back of the root ball. All right. So now, I didn't go back until you asked me to go back and and get some after pictures. So I went back in as soon as I could, which I think was the following weekend. And I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. It might have been a Thursday, but I'm thinking it was the following weekend. And when I got there, the uh, the next picture you have, that was that was uh, sticking out of the back of this. So I'm thinking it's very possible it could have been there when he was there because I didn't get anywhere near the back of the stump that day, uh, obviously. So um, I was kind of preoccupied, uh, but yeah. <laughs> I just I pulled that out and I looked at it and I thought, you know what? It's probably nothing, but how did that how or why was that picked up and put there? It didn't come down with with the root ball or anything like that. So it it, it was up high enough that it was picked up and put there. Did he do it? I don't know, but I thought, you know what, I'm gonna document it anyway. I'm gonna take a picture of it and, and document it anyway. It may mean nothing, but it may mean it may be a sign of tool use and so i figured i'd, I'd document it anyway if you don't document these things and then somebody you see somebody else has it you want to go you know what i had that one time but i didn't pay any attention to it so well i've had that kind of happen before uh, uh something happened or even in the paranormal field uh you sometimes you don't want to run your recorder too soon but then something happened. You say, "Man, I wish I went ahead and turned the recorder on." You know, it's it's kind of like that. And I've had things in the woods happen too. That even sound things that uh, I'll say, "One, well, I'll just run my recorder all day." Well, I get in there, I say, "Hey, I don't want to waste all the space and not catch nothing." You mm -hmm. know, and then something happens. You say, "Man, I should have run my recorder." So, uh, anytime we have anything that stands out to us, looks unusual. Uh, we should document it with photographs, uh, at, le at least with photographs, several photographs, so we could got something to look at later. Because it may be, while well, it may not be nothing now or to you, later on it may become more significant. Absolutely, and like I said, it, it that that particular stick had no 
no natural way of floating up there and driving itself into that root ball. So, and like I said, I know the human traffic. There is none. There's no none zero. So, do you no, think maybe that's something that Carl had did while he was there? Maybe that you didn't notice? Was he digging in the stump or something? Maybe I didn't notice. The only thing I noticed about him is when when he would move his head, he would he would kind of bob up and down. Which is why he was. I almost started calling him Bob. Um, some of my older pitchers uh, are actually named Bob at the root ball, so <laughs> because of the way he moved his head. But really, that's the only thing I noticed. What he would have been doing behind there, I don't know. But just the fact that I found this when I went back into the to get the after picks uh, made me think this. He may have been back there digging at the root ball to get. Uh, grubs or you know anything edible in there there's roots in there yeah so like small roots in there so how long was this uh this 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 white looking limb oh i I wouldn't say it was any more than uh, four feet maybe it wasn't it wasn't even that long it was maybe four feet so to him it would have just been like mere like mere you carrying a normal stick yeah so he could have been back there digging or knocking something loose. Who knows? It's just hard to say. It's hard to say, but the re- but the only re- the reason why I, I I thought it like I said that worth documenting was because the fact that it was in there was odd to begin with, and right after having that happen, who knows? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to say. Well, anytime a a tree uproots like this, it does pull a lot of soil and all kinds of stuff around it so i mean there could have been something there he was after as far as food source or it's hard to say all right shall we go on to the next photograph i hope it's the right one if it's not just tell me and i will so this is uh, a shelter that i found and again always facing an open field or you know reasonably there's a few you can see in the back of this picture where the field is this thing had uh a canopy made of uh brush over the top of it and i thought you know that i i had never seen anything like that before but i mean how often do you actually find structures that still have the brush on them we generally find them with it's just the bones of the structure Right. It's not very often def- a structure that's, a- that ha- that's actually active or recently active. So um, it has a canopy built over the top. It's, it was uh, at the top 18 to 20 feet high, um, very well packed in. And when I looked around it, I actually, I think you, I may have sent you uh, the film of the inside of it when I stepped inside. Uh, and filmed the inside. I think I might have sent you the film for that a few years back. You might have. I, could, I have a hard time remembering. But uh, anyway, I, the thing that I noticed, and it kind of spooked me at the time, was that for all the, the, the branches and everything that that were snapped, and you could clearly tell they were snapped, it was they were they were really rough breaks. There were just as many that were snapped clean. So hmm. I'm thinking, I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, all right, well, am I looking at a hatchet here or what? Because if if so, two things have to happen. I have to leave immediately and get back to the house and let them know that somebody's on their property. But it would make no sense to, for this to be a human hunting shelter, seeing as how it was only, I found it in March. So And I don't think it, w- it would have been there any more than a week before I found it. I found it on one of my very first trips in that year. So uh, it, if this had have been in the fall or something like that, closer to the fall, it, when you, you know, n- not that many people do that around here, but it wanted to build a hunting blind or something like that, then it, it would have made sense. But I, I some of the, and you'll see as, as it, it starts to come down, there are, there are, parts of it that are broken and very jagged and there are other parts that are almost uh, almost like a clean cut so anyway I 
once I started documenting this thing, I, obviously I'm going to keep watching it. But what I noticed was happening was it was slowly being taken apart. That didn't it didn't all come down in one day. It didn't come down in two days. Uh, it was slow slowly being taken apart. And what was being taken off at all of the fresh brush was being taken away. There was no fresh brush, including there's right below the canopy and just off to the right, there was fresh brush laying on the ground. So uh, that was picked up and and gone and taken out of the area. Like all of these, all of these ones that I found in the past, they're they're taking the stuff when they're done with it, like the brush, when they're done with it and taking it completely out of the area they don't just tear these things down and leave the brush lying and I, I it's it's just something that i've documented probably eight to ten times but well, now that you mention it uh you know i know people might be from here i know you are you remember the structure that i documented for almost three years come to think of it when i come in and it was tore down i can't recall any of the pieces laying around no doubt they were moved, man. I, that's, I, fi I found that over and over again. I need to go back and look at my pictures and my video and, and make sure on that. But seem, now that you mentioned it, and I didn't pay no attention to it at the time, I just know that it was destroyed. Uh, but I can't remember calling on the pieces laying around on the ground. No, they, that's the thing is they never are. They're always, it, and not just, you know, thrown off to the side. They're taken completely out of the area. Hmm. Uh, that's something unique, I guess. I hadn't really thought about. So, see, I'm learning too. So now, if you and okay, so I documented this for about roughly three months. So we go to that. You you can go back. That's not is that one there isn't the same picture. That's just that's okay. or right, is let it? Me, uh, let me check here now, because sometimes they're not in order. Okay, yeah, I see the one we're looking for now. Hang on just a second. And we'll get to it. It's actually a past this one. So next one, right there. Yeah. So I'm going back, and you can see that this thing is slowly being taken down. It's not, you know, if 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 by chance people built something like this, and I have to keep saying if because I obviously I didn't see it being built, but I did monitor it being taken down. If people did that, they'd knock it down and leave it lay. That's what people do. Well, if they were to tear down a hunting blind, that would be it. Right. Well, this over three months came down, not piece by piece, but many pieces at a time. And if you want to go on to the, the next ones. Okay. If it's not the right picture, just let me know and I'll. So I think that's, that's pretty close to the last one where it was completely collapsed. And, and. Wow. So. So there, there's either, I think there might be one more before that one. There's not even no greenery there. Left. No, it, it's, it's all taken out of there. Huh. Well, let's go, it, let's go all the way back to, is that, was, was that a part of it as well? So so that was before the, the this one was before the last, uh, okay. basically the final collapse of it. So I go back in again, and like I said, this is over three months. This didn't happen instantly. Um, then that what was, that was there, gone. There's there was nothing on the ground to. Um, I mean, I knew that th that something had been there, cause, and I saw there was there was broken off branches and stuff like that. But other than that, there's no evidence, uh, like right now, as of 2019 anyway. Uh, there was ever anything there. It's all gone and carted out of there. Did you ever find any tracks or anything like that? Oh, this is there's I've found many tracks in this this whole area. This is all an area too, so so yeah, <laughs> plenty. All right, what do we want to look at now, picture wise? Do we want to look at the uh, so that's how it started, correct? That, that's how it started, and that was found right early early started. March, and then it ends up actually a little bit worse than this, which would be. That. that and took them you say three months to slowly disassemble it they slowly took it down over three months and removed every piece that was there wow so and that's why i think a lot of the times 
what people talk to, uh, when they talk about structures and that they not may not necessarily have ever been an active structure they may have it may be some type of sign for certain things and we've both we both have ideas on that sure. but uh, a lot of times I think certain things have been temporary shelters and they have been used but they do what they did here take everything down and all that's left is is the basic bones of the of the structure well and i like the uh structure i documented for almost three years the very top of that structure was not that tile it was probably uh 10 feet maybe off the ground uh so it wasn't actually used for a shelter per se but it was some kind of marker and oh yeah that's that that's uh, definitely some kind of marker uh, for them in my opinion I, anyway i really don't know what caused them to tear it down but I know there was some activity that was out of the ordinary that was fairly close to the area. I don't know if that caused them to do it or maybe it was just time to, to move on or whatever. I don't know, but, uh, but I know it was there for three years. Uh, I documented for almost three years. And what was interesting was they added pieces ever so often. There was some, there was a new stick added and I try and I did leave apples and things like that. They're hoping that they would, uh, uh, maybe get them, and sometimes they would be gone. But you, you know, you never know. A crow could have got them. Well, that's the thing. That's why, like we were talking about the gifting and that. Um, if if you really want to be sure, do the twist off lid thing. Yeah, yeah. I've got. I, I need to do. We need to do a show on on that because I know you've done quite a bit of gifting, and I'm still doing quite a bit. But you had a lot more success. Oh man, that's I, I, ten, the first ten years. I didn't do any, and then for the last 15, that's, man, well, it, I did works it, and it works great. I did it kind of sporadically for a long time, and then now I've been pretty consistent with it. For this is probably going on the second year at least. Now, Leo, you have another very interesting photo here that you might want to tell us about. So us what you think it is? Here, here's the whole thing, and the reason why I put that structure on, a structure on there, if you want to go back and have a look at, at some of the and zoom in maybe you want to do it after we talk about this or whatever and zoom in and have a look you'll see that some of those breaks and everything are very neat <laughs> so compared to you know just taking a, a stick and snapping it um, now I'm not saying this is anything or was used for anything but again coincidental thought I should document it we're doing a show about tool use it's a possibility so you know now this was sticking up out of the ground you can see where it was still wet there mm -hmm. i had sat down um most likely to chug some gatorade while i was at that at the structure there so i'm off where this is is off more to the right of the structure and a little hill there and i it's a place that i stopped fairly often to just kind of stop and catch my breath have a look around and uh so i just i kind of sat there looking at the whole structure thing and thinking about that and i noticed this rock with the just the sharp part sticking up out of the ground and i thought that's kind of odd for that to be just sticking up like that rather than a rock laying on the ground like well, why would that be so I, I pulled it out and i looked over it and that's when it kind of hit me that you know that rock looks like it was jammed into the ground and there's a rock over here that looks like it was jammed into the ground and a rock over here that looks like it was jammed into the ground so i pull them out and there's nothing unusual about the other ones they're basically flat slate rock like this and not no no sharp point or anything but this one in particular i thought was worth a look at because simply because of those what almost looked like cuts in that that shelter so again not making any claims of course but if we're talking about the possibility of tool use these are things that i've kept uh around for a reason and uh i mean they're worth they're worth considering well looking at that rock if it was jammed down into the ground would do you think they could have taking a branch possibly on the point and use it kind of that way or do you think they actually used it in their hand and 
and used it to cut it with. Well, I would think if they were doing anything, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, their skin is thick, but you know, you're putting any, you're trying to hold that in your hand, and you're putting any force behind it and coming down on, on even even small limbs. You've got to come down with that on force if you want it, if you want to snap it off. So, uh, I don't know. You would think they cut their, they'd cut their hands on it. So that would be a negative right there. So you think maybe they would, if they were, if they were using this as a tool, it was jabbed into the ground, and they were using the branch on the pony part as it was sticking up. I would think they would have to have something like that, um, simply, simply because, like I said, it, you would, it would tough skin or not, it's going to cut your hand when you're slamming that down on a, on a branch. Well, this this brings an interesting point up for me. Uh, that maybe other people have thought about it. I know me and you talked about it briefly. What if, and this is a big what if, I guess, what if some of the things uh, that we attribute to Native American tool use is actually not Native American tool use, that it actually is Sasquatch Bigfoot tool use? I think that's a real possibility. Well, some of these these things, if you take... You know, they find something of a, of a certain size and have it in a, in a museum, and then you find something similar to that, and it dates back to roughly the same time, but looks even more primitive, and is quite and is you know reasonably larger. Who's to say they didn't gift? We we know they gifted back and forth. Who's to say they didn't gift these kinds of things back and forth? And I feel like they're intelligent enough that they could have learned to use tools either by just naturally learning how to use them or by Native Americans showing them how to use them. And both. I mean, I think they they showed each other things. And, and, and in a lot of the legends, that's basically what it says. But where because just because it's a, a legend, then there can't be any truth to it. So... People don't take it seriously until a white guy comes along and claims it. <laughs> well, you know, this is another thing, too. We, you talk about, we talk about this pony rock. Uh, there's been reports of Bigfoot wearing animal skins. Uh, could it possibly use a sharp rock to help skin the animal? Uh, I think it's very possible. I mean, we use a knife uh, to skin our deer and squirrels and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there are some reports that Bigfoot does wear or use animal skins in some way well uh, they're going to do it's only the it's only natural to you know the path of least resistance so they're going to if there's something around if they're smart enough to do everything that they do and they do very well very successfully um it's it's kind of foolish to think that they're not going to, if they have access to something they know is sharp, that they're not going to field dress a deer with that sharp item rather than with try to do it with their nails and, and all this. They know how to do it. They know what they're doing. So, the, the, of course, to say to think they don't, they're not capable. I'm not saying they do use tools. What I, what, as in stating that as a fact, what I'm saying is it's a kind of a silly thought to think that they don't. Well, like I said earlier, when we started this segment, I think using uh, sticks and uh, rocks to beat on trees, that's uh, really a kind of a form of uh, tool use. And then someone in the chat had also uh, mentioned uh, rock clacking and rock stacking and things like that. So they, they do know uh, that rocks and sticks and things like that can be used for various, various things. So uh, I don't think it's a big stretch at all. Enough it's funny, people, people will give them cre so much credit for being able to to do what they do, but anything beyond a certain point, people are like, no, 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 we can't have them doing that. We can't allow that they do that. Well, look, if, they were, if they're smart enough with everything we have, if they're smart enough to stop any of us from getting what would be considered the ultimate proof, uh, if they're smart enough for that, don't underestimate them on anything. Right. Uh, well, we know there's numerous reports of them killing deer or either uh, taking a, a hunter's kill 
Well, we know, of course, they most likely eat the deer, but there's something left over with that hide. Uh, I'm sure they're smart enough to use it in some way to do something with it. If I was a gambler, I'd, I'd, I'd bet the farm on it. And then they're not, they're not going to, they're not going to let the, they're not going to let skins. Just waste. I'm, I, I'm not going to go make it any claims or anything, but I, I will say this. They're not going to let hardly anything of, of an animal go to waste, especially the skins. So that's, they're not. Well, that gonna... reminds me of people who were raised in the fifties and sixties. Uh, man, if they killed or slaughtered a, a hog or something like that, there was very little waste with it. They eat everything. Uh, same with cattle and the squirrels, or whatever. I mean, a lot of the old timers ate squirrel brains and scrambled eggs. They, they'd eat the brain of the animal. Uh, I don't. I'm not. I, I like squirrel, but I don't. I'm not interested in eating their brain. No. <laughs> uh, so it, to me, and they live off the land. Bigfoot does. I'm sure they don't. There's very little waste with them. And then we can look at gorillas and monkeys and orangutans and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they do, uh, they use tools. Uh, if I remember correctly, there's one where they're, it's, uh, I think it's chimpanzees sticking a s slender stick down into an ant, an ant hill and then getting all the ants on it and eating them off. But that is a tool. Uh, so, and just like the gorillas, they, uh, some of those make, uh, tree structures and things to sleep in so i don't think it's a far stretch at all well like i said if if, if you can accept that they can do all of the things that they can do to think that they would ignore the ability to use their hands for for tools is you know that's kind of not giving them as, as much credit as as they deserve so I'm not making any claims on what I've shown here, right. but it, like I said, there were things that, that I considered and they were, they were worth keeping track of. What, and when the subject of tool use came up, then, you know, well, it's, uh, it's a subject you don't hear very many people talk about uh, is tool use. I guess most people, for most people, it's, uh, seems like an impossibility, but I think they're very, and in, they're intelligent enough to use tools and like i said even if you're thinking about territorial fights you're thinking about tree knocks uh things like that they're in a way they're using tools and uh, they're using weapons uh when they throw rocks at investigators or people who are encroaching on their territory uh they're using a rock as a weapon slash tool to run them off or scare them or whatever uh same basic thing for me i think you know it's uh it's a behavior where they're using a, uh, a tool or a weapon to uh, get what they want, to get people out of the area or whatever. Yeah, I just, uh, it, it just boggles my mind, though, when, when people say that. And they don't, another thing they'll say is, well, don't throw another thing into the mix. We don't know enough now or we don't know anything now. Well, you're not going to know anything about this if you if you're not out there and and maybe these odd odd things and odd finds don't mean anything but then maybe they do well they should be documented uh, my thing is i think they're intelligent enough and understand enough to use fire uh how they would obtain it and get it i don't know but i think they understand what it what fire can do uh why don't we see them using it? Maybe it's a uh, an a, a effort that they make to keep you know stay concealed or whatever. But I think they probably could have the capability to use fire if they really wanted to. Well, that and for the most part, we're not looking. I mean, who's who who is who's sitting around looking for little tiny campfire smoke all the right. time? That they could do it. Literally, thousands of them could do it all at one time and nobody's going to pay any attention to a little campfire over here, a little campfire over there. No, they are going to well, assume it's people, a little bit of people. campfire smoke and that's it. Well, that's me. If I looked and seen smoke, I would most likely think it was uh, some people camping or out partying or, or something like that. I wouldn't think about it as Bigfoot roasting a rabbit. 
<laughs> they're they're going to do whatever they can to make the least amount of smoke, and they would have the wisdom to know what that is. But uh, like I said, they, people say, "Well, you you they don't they don't use fire." Uh, I wouldn't go quite that far <laughs> to say they don't use fire. Who who's looking? Who's monitoring the woods all the time? Right. To see the little bits of campfire smoke coming up. Nobody is. Well. Uh... It, maybe they don't use it as often as oh no no as, as, as people would think you know or, or or they hope they would uh, you know use it where you could just find them but and I think another thing too tool usage and uh, even things like like we're talking about like fire and stuff like that and structures I think it varies by group and by area absolutely uh, some places may not need. Uh, to use tools as much or may not even know how to use tools as much as another group. So I think there's a lot of variables there. And it's like the age old thing where people have been told and uh, TV shows have indoctrinated them that all Bigfoot look alike and all Bigfoot do not look alike. They're as varied as, as humans, if not more so. Uh, yes, this basic structure uh, body structure is the same, but they m may be a quite a bit of difference in color and facial features and things like that, just like humans. And you can go even further, which I do myself, and that's uh, I don't I don't think that as much as I agree with the different tribes and and everything, I'm I'm short of knowing it. You know, to be a fact, I'm I'm very comfortable saying that uh, different tribes are going to act different ways. They're going to have different their own different, you know, ways that they do things and all of that. But it also seems, if you look at the very, it think they vary so much. To me, we're dealing with the, with not only different tribes of of Sasquatch. We're dealing with other things out there that resemble them in the way that they're larger, their hair covered, but hardly, re if at all, related to them at all. Um, I know because of what happened with Becca and I that whatever those two things were had zero in common with any that I had seen before. Uh, seen from a distance, seen up close, interacted with, whatever, they had nothing in common except they were large and they were covered with hair. They acted and looked uh, more apish and and the... I know the rocking back and forth has been attributed to Sasquatch too, but who's to say that person thought didn't think they were seeing a Sasquatch and was seeing what I, the same thing that I saw. So... But and we 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 put the Bigfoot name on it, but uh, completely animal animalistic ways, movements, and everything compared to anything I had seen or interacted with before. So I think we're not only dealing with multiple types, multiple tribes. I think we're dealing with multiple species. I mm -hmm. I don't think that they're they have anything else in common other than being in the woods and hair covered. Well, another thing too that we probably should consider uh we know that there are uncontacted tribes on our world in our planet that uh, never saw a white man they may have saw an airplane or something like that go over and don't understand what it is well i think we've got pockets of sasquatch that are probably they've probably never seen humans uh they they're probably really uh, isolated, just like an isolated tribe would be. And then we got others, like we have some that's fairly local here that I, I've seen a few times, and they've caused a little bit of havoc around the neighborhood uh, occasionally, uh, that are more, um, uh, they're more used to humans being around. So anytime you got those two spectrums, people, who, you know, Sasquatch people who've never saw humans and and Sasquatch people who've been around them for the last 50 years or 100 years, you're going to have a behavior difference. Uh, you're going to have, uh, uh, like you say, the the ones that's more isolated may be more uh, aggressive or animalistic. I think mean, the word you used than those who have been around humans. Uh, I think that shapes their behavior, and that, and it could even play a part in 
uh, using tools and building shelters or anything. It's hard to say. And and another thing too is that I don't think it's a coincidence that when people go, the further people go into the woods, that's where they tend they seem to have these negative type encounters. I mean, you hear about you hear about ones where you, I, Bigfoot almost broke into my trailer. Bigfoot almost caught me. Bigfoot almost mm -hmm. killed me. Yeah, uh huh. Almost. There would be no almost. If he, they wanted to do any of that, it would happen. There's no almost. So, but you, you, these tend to be more negative, whereas things that aren't so far away uh, from civil, civilization, not every encounter is pleasant, but you certainly hear of the more pleasant ones in those type of areas. So you've got these ones, and like, even with the multiple species theory, uh, with with Sasquatch people alone, the ones that are closer to civilization, for lack of a better word, uh, obviously want to be there. If they didn't want to be there, if they didn't want anything to do with us at all, didn't want to monitor us and watch us at all, they wouldn't be there. They'd be back where the other ones are that tend to be more negative. Well, yeah, I, I thought about this too while you were talking. You were talking about uh, maybe one that's more isolated, a group that's more isolated. I think about, because I live here in the southeastern Kentucky Appalachian Mountains, and us good old hillbillies, we're kind of like that in a way, if because we're all, we're kind of by ourselves a lot of ways. Our government even don't care about us, so, <laughs> you know, they don't care what happens to southeastern Kentucky. They, don't, they, have, no, they have no clue. They don't, they don't care about anybody here. Uh, so, but the way we are, where we're kind of, uh, I guess, isolated in a way, when we have an outsider come in, uh, some people are not as friendly. Uh, this is, I mean, if you get on the main drag, it ain't too bad. But like, if you, I know places where, if you got back too far, man, you would be questioned. Uh, it's not as bad as it used to be. It used to, they would probably just kill you. <laughs> now, they, now they'll question and see what you're doing there and who you are and that kind of thing. And it's because they're isolated and they're not used to seeing a lot of people around. So I would say that would probably be the same with, uh, with Bigfoot. If they're in an isolated area and they rarely or almost never see a human, um, they might not be as friendly neither uh, at, when someone comes in on their territory. Well, I'll, I'm, I'm going to give you a fine example of that of when I went to Kentucky. Um, <laughs> me and my wife were out, just we were out wandering the woods. Um, it was pro it was property at one time that w that she was that it was it was owned by someone that she was related to. So it wasn't anymore, but she didn't care. She still walked on it. So we get two side by sides coming at us, four guys on each, armed to the teeth. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. But the way it turned out, because I'm standing there, I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm going to get blown away the first time that I've come this far <laughs> south. I'm going to get blown away in Kentucky. This is not good. But anyway, they, they get talking, uh, the the front guy and, and my wife get talking. Turns out somehow they're related way back, and they offer us a cabin for the night on <laughs> their property for our honeymoon. So... Oh. That could have been very bad right. had, it, had it gone a different way. But <laughs> Well, I know uh, we have an area here where uh, growing up, my dad and stuff didn't want me going over because it was a rough area. There was quite a few people they would find, uh, you know, killed, murdered, and stuff like that. But he'd always, when I'd go over there because there was a lake over there and we'd go fishing and swimming and things like that, he'd always tell me, now, you're kin to so-and-so over there, and you're kin to that guy over there. And, <laughs> and if anybody bothers you, you tell them, but, hey, you're so-and-so, you know, you're kin to so-and-so on that side and and uh, stuff like that. That way you, you didn't have no trouble. So uh, once they find out you're okay and you're you're a possibly distant kin or something like that, you everything's all right. Yeah, if, if it's it's the stranger thing that, that uh, yeah, if people want to be left alone. They want to be left alone, and unless you're unless you're related to them, unless you've known them, you know, for years, they don't want you around, and they don't have any trouble telling you either. Uh, no, that's for sure. Uh, somebody had mentioned that Sasquatch in uh, Alaska, a 
appear to be more aggressive, and, and I, can, that, I, can go, I can go back to uh, less people. They don't see people very often. That could be why. More and, and what they have seen, they probably that's why they're in Alaska. I mean, yeah. Yeah. if okay. they don't want anything to do with this, I, I, I don't think it's a fair stretch to say that those are the ones that are more that they stay further back for a reason. Well, even in our human society, we got people like me who uh, kind of like to be alone. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to go on vacation to a beach and fight through the sand and people and teenagers and beer cans and stick their old umbrella into the sand. That's to me, that's not a vacation. That's misery. I'd rather be back in the woods somewhere with a little campfire next to the lake and uh, listening to the sound of nature than finding some guy on the beach for a, a nice spot. <laughs> yeah, and I was a teenager once, but that was a long time ago. Yeah. I, mean, I have no desire for any of that. I just don't, I mean, I understand people like to go to the beach and things like that, but uh, I'd rather, I, and when I was younger, we went to the beach in Daytona and all that kind of stuff, but, and it was okay, it's nice to see, and but just like when we went to uh, uh, Niagara Falls. Man, Niagara Falls is a beautiful place. I just wish it wouldn't have been nobody there but me that day. <laughs> you know, where I could just loaf around and looked around and things like that. But instead, it was uh, bumper to bumper and uh, elbow to elbow everywhere you went. And uh, that just kind of takes the fun out of it to me. Well, see, on the South Shore, we kind of have the best of both worlds because we have beaches everywhere, which means there's plenty of private beaches. So you get to enjoy both i mean there's plenty of crowded beaches that are i mean those are the closest ones but they suck because they're crowded so <laughs> no I, if i want to go to if we want to go to a beach there's plenty of beaches where you and the couple of people that you go with are are there so it's that's that's really one of the really nice things about the south shore and so that it is understandable that maybe uh, certain groups of bigfoot or individual if you could break it down even to individual bigfoot uh, some of them may not want to be around people. Some of them may want to be around people for the uh, uh, for the ex the excess stuff we throw away, like uh, maybe when we throw our garbage out and it's or, or some old uh, steak in it or something that they can get a quick meal easy without having to do a whole lot. Or maybe it's something like that too that plays a factor. But I think that like you, like we said, they vary uh, because of where they're at. Uh, and what they've been around. Well, that shapes all of our behavior, what we've experienced through our life. That shapes our behavior and our beliefs as we get older. So it only makes sense to me. Yep. Uh, so I guess uh, in conclusion on this subject, we can say that uh, that we can agree that Bigfoot, whether they use hand tools or not, they are intelligent enough to use them if they want to. That's for sure. And without a doubt, they probably do in some degree. Uh, I mean, other animals do. Uh, I think someone might have been Wendy mentioned about birds and stuff using uh, really what what would we consider a tools. Uh, I know there was one about I think it was a crow was taking walnuts and dropping them in the road and let the cars run over them to bust them, and then mm -hmm. he'd go down and eat them. So you know they're um, how much more intelligent is Bigfoot than a crow? <laughs> you know? And that's that, that. That's the thing, though, is crows is, are are considered a nuisance and stuff like that, but they are brilliantly smart birds. Yeah. Well, you know, that made me think about something. I got a friend locally who uh, he had a Bigfoot sighting, and as he, best I can remember, as he turned a little hill in the mountains, this Bigfoot was sitting and taking a rock and some acorns and taking another rock and busting them up and getting the acorns. So that is tool use as well. Yeah, what what when I hear people say, well, don't throw that into the mix, it's, it's don't talk about tool use, that just confuses things. And no, it doesn't. It, <laughs> It's that's not that's not what confuses things in the Bigfoot world. Mm -hmm. Trying new, trying new things and, and looking into new things that's the least you know problematic thing in the Bigfoot world. That's what people should be doing. Right. You know, we can only look at the Mark Anders photo, <laughs> you know, a million times a week before and tell people it's it's Mark Anders. It's not real. 
uh, you know, or the Bigfoot walking around the lake. How many times are we going to tell people that that's not real, folks? Uh, but, you know, don't mention that they might use a rock to smash a wall under an acre. <laughs> uh, well, because if, if a lot of people, and I, but I am seeing a change because I'm seeing, I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example. Okay. I don't, I don't watch a lot of, of podcasts and stuff like that, but this week I watched my friend Spencer Jameson on, actually on the show that I'm going to be on on the 28th, uh, uh, discover Sasquatch and they did nothing but talk complete sense that whole show uh, about you know new ideas of doing things and people net networking with the right people that are you know uh, avoiding all the other crap and, uh, and networking with the right people trying out new, new things and, and things like that so if you get a chance to watch that you should and that's coming from someone who doesn't watch many podcasts at all but and I'm not saying it because they're friends of mine. I, I'm just getting to know Chris now. Uh, know Spencer a little better from from uh, Beast TV. Uh, he he does a lot of stuff with them. But uh, if you get a chance, to check that out because that, it's a really, really good show. No nonsense talk through the whole thing. Just two guys with some new ideas and and some, some things about the Bigfoot world that... Uh, I mean, they weren't cutting the Bigfoot world down or anything like that. Just things that just a lot of sense being spoken about the subject as a whole. So if you get well, a chance, check it out. I don't watch a lot of uh, podcasts, and I don't even watch a lot of documentaries. Occasionally, I'll watch one. Uh, one thing I do watch sometimes while I'm uh, maybe relaxing or just maybe I'm eating or working on something, I'll turn on uh, paranormal caught on camera i like it because it's kind of quick flash in the pan type stuff and uh, some of it's pretty cool and some of it is uh, you know it's obvious it's fake uh but that's okay I, I you know i go into the show knowing that uh but i don't watch a whole lot of documentaries and things like that uh i don't know i don't maybe i don't know why i just i mean i enjoy some of that stuff but uh, i don't know i it would might it might be just a me thing well, actually, no, it actually does it with Dad, too. Dad, I've got Dad turned to the point where tr watching them will irritate me. I'm like, Why are you not looking at this? Why are you looking at that? And do you really think this is going to work? I, no, I get irritated. Well, I know the feeling because uh, I, I watched uh, Finding Bigfoot quite a bit back when it first came out. And I always liked the witness interviews in the town hall, that type of stuff. I thought that was actually the best part of the program. The only but part any, for me. But anytime you do a, uh, all you want to do is night investigation, you're just missing the mark. You're, there's too much you cannot see at night with this little bitty light and this small field of view. Uh, I'm not against uh, doing night investigation. I like, I like doing it occasionally, but I'd rather be out in the daytime where I can see better. And uh, I won't walk within 20 feet of a structure and miss it because of, because it's dark, you know, or something. <laughs> no, the, the whole uh, you're at night, your potential, the better things that you, that could happen at night. I mean, the, the only advantages to that is you're more, you're much more likely to get clearer vocals and, and cause you know, they're going to travel. It's quieter. They're going to travel further. Uh, they are more vocal with each other at night. Uh, they tend to move in closer if they're if they're not used to seeing you. They're, you know, they'll tend to they tend to move in a little closer at night. So if you've got like FLIR or something like that, beneficial that way. But a lot of the evidence that you're going to see, it's going to be in the daytime. Nighttime mm -hmm. is cool and fun, and you know, it's 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 a fun thing to do. And if you hear a vocal, it's a little more exciting than in the broad daylight. But you know, it gives you a little bit more of a rush. But no, your your evidence for the most part, you're gonna you're gonna catch that in the in between dawn and dusk is, is very active as far as noises in the woods and because I think other things are moving around too. And you know, they're gonna make the larger vocals generally at night. But but the evidence itself the you're going to find you're going to find a lot more of that in the daytime well i always had pretty good luck early in the mornings uh, mm -hmm. uh you know what still kind of foggy and the dew still on and that mm -hmm. type of stuff 
uh, I don't know if they're maybe traveling back to wherever they came from or, or whatever, but I, I've had pretty good luck that way. But I've had things happen in the daytime, too, uh, as far as vocals and things like that uh, as well, right in the middle of the day. So it's, I think it's been in the right area at the right time. It's the, it's the, for me, it's been the key. I've went into an area I know that is active uh, or that's norm has, you know, normally it's pretty active. I've went in there at times and there's nothing going on. And then I went in there the other times and I'm getting wood knocks or vocals or, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. So you know, it's just, it, I think timing is the biggest thing for me. It has been anyways. Timing and dumb luck. But when people have asked me in the past, what, uh, what, what would be the best time of the day? Uh, depends on what you're looking for, but if you're looking for to hear and, and possibly have some type of, you know, uh, possible visual encounter, dawn and dusk are the two best times yeah. for for anything like that because they're at, at dusk, they're heading out, at dawn, they're heading home. Yep. So, that's, that's what I'll, I always tell people. I've always had good luck in the mornings. Yep. Uh, it's rare that I'm out of the evenings, but I, sometimes I am, and sometimes I'm out at night. But uh, most of the time, I've had my best luck in the mornings. Yeah, I have to, with all nighters, what I have to do is I have to sleep as much as I can that day because I don't, if I do an all nighter, I'm not going to sleep. There are times where I'll lay back and I'll doze off or whatever, but I don't go in. If I do an all-nighter, I'm going into here and see what's, you know, whatever I can. I'm not going into sleep. I've got some places I would like to go camp overnight. Uh, but usually I would have to go by myself. And, of course, that ups the dangers, not necessarily for Bigfoot, but uh, we got cougars and all kinds of stuff around here, which I would take a weapon. But still, it's good to have a, the buddy system work sometimes. <laughs> hmm. Well, I mean, it, it's... We all do it, but it's the, the, always the, the safest way is is bring somebody and always have somebody with you. But that's not realistic sometimes. No, most of the time I'm by myself, anyways. Uh, probably ninety five percent of the time, maybe more, uh, I'm by myself. Uh, and and the thing is, around here we have the venomous snakes. And if you're back on Gobbler's Knob and you get bit by a rattlesnake, you're just not going to make it out. Uh, I know in in the film me and uh, Tony Flossie did, uh, Bigfoot, The Legend is Real, we were estimated, if they knew exactly where we were at, we were three hours for someone to get to us. And we had just seen a, a big rattlesnake. Three hours. Uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's a long, if they knew exactly where we were at. So most likely, if you get bit by a rattlesnake back where we were at, you're just not going to make it. You're not going home. That's, uh, Not alive, anyway. Uh, someone asked a question, Leo, and uh, do the northern Bigfoot know about their southern cousins? Well, I'll put it this way. I How do I? Well, I mean, it's in my book, so I, there's no point in, you know, dancing around it. What, what I know of, that they know of as far as others, is that there's others out there that aren't them. Uh, but people have, have said for years uh, that they communicate over long distances and that. So I'm sure they know what we know and, and much more when it comes to the other ones. So, I mean, I'm sure they know. I'm sure they have uh, the lowdown on all of the other ones <laughs> m- much more than what we could ever guess at. Well, that's me. I think... Uh... While they may not know them on a personal level, they understand that there's more uh, like them out there in other yeah, locations. Know of them, but not ne- yeah, n- not necessarily not know necessarily them. Know them as a personal. Yeah, uh, I mean that's like me. I know there's people in Butte, Montana, but I can't name one person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know any individuals living there right off. Uh, but I know there's people out there. So I think it's kind of that same effect and. Uh, at some point, I would say that uh, some of these younger juvenile Bigfoot move on to another, other locations just because, you know, a, a patch of land can only only house so many Bigfoot and provide food, shelter, and all that kind of stuff. At some point, it becomes overcrowded. Somebody's got to move on uh, and, you know, get some more territory. And I say that happens sometime in, 
and so they understand that too that way you know old cousin joe he lives over that that ridge uh with his harem of female bigfoot (laughs) well i can i can tell you from what i've observed here and and with this this group i don't i again i always have to point out i'm not talking about anybody what anybody else's experience that i don't i'm not there so i don't know but what seems to be the idea here is once the age of maturity happens they go off and they meet their mate and that they would generally either go back to uh near where her parents would be or where his parents would be so uh if i'm understanding that correctly and i I, but that's the way it it looks to me right well a lot of times we do that as humans uh which my wife is from uh, michigan which is a long way off but uh we settled here close to my parents uh another scenario could have been we could have moved up there for work or whatever so I can understand that that they would move close uh, I, I think that a uh, a section of mountain can house howls so many Bigfoot before it becomes uh, it becomes a resource issue uh, and in and, and, uh, cases where a resource is- issue comes available uh, somebody's got to move on uh, maybe it's not far Maybe it's just a couple ridges over or uh, across the mountain or something like that. So I think that if it's possible, they would stay in close proximity to family, if, if possible. Yeah, and, and they're not going to, um, as, as well as they know the earth, the forest, everything like that, aside from you know a group of real jackasses coming along and, and wanting to be a pain, um they're not gonna they're smart enough to not let that happen let not let the overpopulation of one area happen right may move on and and i probably understand that resources are getting scarce or or something like that and well here i've met uh, geo bigfoot and their their clan is kind of small so i'm gonna go live with them and build me a place over there or something like that i'm sure they understand that well, of course. I mean, it would be like us looking down a looking at a street. Uh, once there's enough houses built on that street, you know you can't keep building houses. So they, right. uh, that's 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 their street in a sense. So they would know, you know, okay, we're getting kind of crowded here. So let's spread things out. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, okay, so since I guess we've uh, covered more than just Bigfoot two of you, we've covered quite a bit of behavior and thoughts about that. Uh, our next subject is going to be the Roger Patterson, uh, Patty Bigfoot footage. And I know I've seen some stuff on this recently. Ouch. My butt's sore from sitting so much. Uh, I've seen some stuff on this recently about guessing the height, how tall Patty was. Uh, I've, <laughs> it's funny. I've seen some people who claim that Patty was only five foot three, that she was very small. And uh, I've seen others that say she was seven foot three, uh, <laughs> but I have a hard time believing she was just five foot three because I have a copy of one of her, her foot tracks. So uh, <laughs> I think she was bigger than five foot three. <laughs> uh, man, that's, I thought I had heard <laughs> in all these years, I thought I had heard everything about that <laughs> film to the point of, I just, I don't even debate it with people anymore. I, I don't, you and I can talk about it because we don't go at each other's throat. If we disagree uh-huh. on something, we just say, well, this is what I think and then move on. But right. it uh, just, uh, uh, but five foot three, I had never heard it. Yeah, that's, some of them said it's that's five a new foot one. three. Yeah, that's, that's a little bit small. Uh, someone asked a question too about, uh, uh, about how Bigfoot passed the time and what kind of culture do they have and things like that. And uh, I'm, I'm confident that they do have a family type structure, uh, that they have, uh, well, I guess you would consider elders in the group that's, uh, that's probably um, passes down knowledge. And as far as passing time, 
uh, when you're out in the bush like that, I'd say that you don't have a whole lot of time, idle time on your hands because you're too busy either securing food or looking for food or preparing for winter. But in the event that they do have extra time, they may use it to pass on knowledge or skills to the younger ones, even as far as uh, how to make structures or uh, what structures mean or uh, or things like that. So that's my uh, thought about it. Well, if you took if you take a look at the the structures that you and I have both found that they look like what a large structure should look like, but they're on a very small scale. So that's that that could be them, the smaller ones learning from an older mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Okay, this is how you have to build it, but they're, they're small, so they're building it on a smaller scale. I can think of one hilarious example is the, is a TP type structure that I found that was bit tilted sideways, and there's no way the thing was ever going to stand up on just the three poles that was there. <laughs> so when I, I found it, and I, I immediately cracked up because a lot with the three poles that were that were standing like this, there was just one little branch that came with that it came to a little bit of a fork, and that was <laughs> braced, and the branch was jammed into the ground to hold this poor leaning tower of Bigfoot <laughs> to hold it up because it was not going to ever going to stand on its own. But it was hilarious just to to see it all. I'm sure I've you've seen, seen the picture, but I've seen so you. many things. Uh, uh, when it comes to stick structures, I've seen so many weird things. Mm -hmm. uh, stuff I had no idea what it means. One of them, I, I think I know what it means, but uh, it was just marking a trail. I don't know why. Uh, we had a, a limb land to the left, and then you would go about 10 foot, and you'd have a limb land up in a tree to the right, and then another 10 foot and one to the left, all the way down the mountain. Uh, and I think it was just marking the trail down that little ravine is what I think was going on there. Uh, but there was, a, there was a bigger structure close by, too, and uh, it was probably 10, 12 foot tall. I have no idea. It, it almost looked like, funny enough, it almost looked like something out of Blair Witch. How you had the, almost looked like a man type shape. Mm -hmm. It was kind of similar to that. Not 100%, but it's kind of similar to that. And that was right close to where that trail was marked. So they do a lot of weird stuff with sticks that I don't understand. So, Yeah, and then to say that for sure what this means or what that means, when people tell you that. Oh, dogs will not, well, dogs will not track. Yeah, I just saw that too. Uh, Anybody tells you uh, 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 their dog is a friend with a Bigfoot, it's immediately, uh, it's a red flag. It's just not true. I've had hunting dogs, experienced hunting dogs around Bigfoot. They are 100% terrified. They're not going to track it. It's it's not going to happen. I, I I know of a guy that that uh, both of his hunting dogs um, extremely well trained, and there there is one area that uh, coincidentally the person that did he didn't even know this person had their sighting. Uh, they must be a reasonably within a reasonably close area because uh, the dogs just freak out, stop, drop to the ground. They whimper. They they will not yeah. go. No, no, yeah. dogs don't work. Don't dogs don't work with Bigfoot. They freak out. Dogs time. sense it and they will just run and hide. I've seen it several times. Uh, just a few years ago, a guy actually watched a Bigfoot tear his coonhound in two. Uh, I did a story on it. Uh, I think it was Kentucky Bigfoot who actually did the interview with the guy. And I covered the story, and he actually witnessed. They went back to the site and everything. Uh, they witnessed the Bigfoot kill his dog. Uh, so the dogs don't want, don't want anything to do with Bigfoot. Now, with that being said, though, I, I don't think it's a common thing for for a Sasquatch for no reason to kill, to walk into someone's yard and just kill their dog randomly. Uh, that's another. It's a that's another one of those behaviors that would be different between different tribes or even different sure. types. Well, so, but I actually maybe. did an interview just about two or three weeks ago, and they had a story of uh, the the guy had seen what he thought was two people sitting up in the edge of the mountain smoking cigarettes because he could, he thought he was seeing the red ambers off the cigarette. 
Well, that's he walked over there, and that's not what it was. It was a Bigfoot. And at the time, they had their dogs pinned under their house. Uh, that's they go in, in and out under the house. And that Bigfoot got in up, got under that house, and was killing their dogs. And actually, did kill them. And he had ran in the house and got his gun and was shooting through the floor to try to stop the Bigfoot from killing his dog, but it, it killed. Him. Uh, so yeah, they they will kill dogs. Oh, I have no doubt that 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 I just don't think it's a as far as the ones that, you know, I know of, it's not a frequent occurrence that just out of spite, they're going to walk into your yard. Like, don't stop putting your dog outside because Bigfoot's going to eat your dog. It's yeah. The chances are pretty slim. Uh, I don't even think uh, you can get one to trail a Bigfoot. I think quick as it smells that. No, well, that's, that's what I mean. It, it's gone. Yep. Uh, I know that our dogs, that night we ran in on, we had two experienced hunting dogs. That night we ran in on them, man. They just run back in between our legs, scared to death, trembling. Uh, well, they are not interested in it. <laughs> no, and anybody that I that I know of that has tried it, and this would be from 2009 to now, and I could I could probably name four or five people that I know that have tried it aside from the other stories that you read online from people that have tried it yeah. uh no it, it don't work they will not go after them they, they will them. drop to the ground and they become whimpering little cowards that yeah. and these are these are some badass dogs but they just won't they will not they won't follow well them. another thing that we're talking about that uh right here close behind my house is where they had the bigfoot that was uh in the in the field next to these people's house in the creek actually found some tracks and stuff i've done a video on our youtube uh i think they have a either a pit bull or a rock waller and it ran and it defecated on itself it was so scared of the bigfoot that was next door it ran and hid and pooped on itself uh but a couple of days prior there was a big bear walking through there and it was at the fence trying to get to the bear so that tells you the difference it, it was definitely it wasn't a bear that they saw you know standing next door but it ran and uh, defecated on itself. It was so scared. Yeah, it's a total different ball game when it, if they pick up the scent of of a Bigfoot, they just nope. Just won't, I just won't do it, man. No, I've, well, my see that was my first experience with Bigfoot uh, when I was about fifteen or sixteen years old when my dad coon hunting. Uh, at the time, I didn't know what it was, but man, I found out later. And the dogs were terrified, but not only were the dogs terrified, we were terrified because our dogs would normally not act like that. Uh, and we had, you know, we had, we had a, uh, I think we had a shotgun, 12 gauge shotgun, if I remember correctly. Uh, mine had a 22, but a rifle, but uh, yeah, that was, and I, since then, I've, you know, over the years, I've actually bigfooted that area and, um, found some stuff back in there tracks and things like that over the years but right back in that same general area but at the time man when i was young and that one dog was probably a good 50 75 pound dog uh, he didn't want nothing to do with it no i don't i don't know of, of that ever working out well for anybody ever <laughs> no uh, okay let's we kind of got off topic a little bit but let's get back to the patty film uh, this is a still frame uh, from the Patterson footage. So this is one of the real early still frames that if you can, if you'll notice, you can see that uh, uh, it's kind of crouched down here. And this would be the butt cheek and the leg, and that's her head. Uh, and there's always been debate on on the Patterson footage. Uh, <laughs> I remember. I remember this. Yeah. There's always been a, a debate over uh, the Patterson footage, whether it's real, whether it's fake, whether it hoax. This right here is a suit that was made by the late uh, Leroy Blevins, who was also from Kentucky, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he made this suit as a replica to prove that big that the Patterson footage was fake. But as you can see, this looks. Well, it may be a good suit and all that kind of stuff. It don't look like Patty. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. And I, the man Leroy was, I've uh, been in talk uh, several, several times. He was on my friends list and stuff. 
But we got along. We just didn't agree on this. He, he was convinced that the Patterson footage was a hoax. He was very nice to me as far as providing links to uh, any time. Because when I when I first get into this, um, I had I had no prior exposure to Patty, so I didn't see the Patterson film, and then all of a sudden develop a. Uh, you know, an interest in Bigfoot. I didn't, I, I, I may have seen a clip of it or something on our, on the two channels we had on TV, but I, I only found out really about, about Patty after I had uh, my sighting. So uh, that's why I'm a little more jaded on the whole thing, but he was very nice to me as far as when I would ask him questions about what, what, uh, the work he had done and the, as far as studying and stuff like that, he would be sending me the links left, right, and center <laughs> for me. And I don't, I don't know how I didn't drive the man nuts. Well, one thing about the Patterson footage, it's been out there so long. Uh, you can find literally uh, hundreds and hundreds of links and analysis and zooms. And uh, he said it was fake. This one said it was real. I was the guy in the suit. No, I was the guy in the suit. I mean, you can find about any avenue you want to go on this, uh, and it will sway you. But really what you should be doing is actually looking at the footage for yourself without uh, maybe all the opinions and making up your own mind. Does this look real? Uh, is this muscle movement I'm seeing? Is uh, well, well, in case of Patty, was this a breast movement that we were seeing? And even though uh, uh, M.K. Davis has done a lot of a, a good uh, analysis on this, there's some things that I don't agree with him on. But as far as slowing it down and showing some of the movements and muscle movements and stuff, he's done some, uh, some real good work on that. And I, re I like M.K. A lot of people don't like M.K. Davis, but I like M.K. Davis. They, I, I. The only, all I'm going to say about the whole thing with MK is MK was a swell guy until he had he brought up a question that made made people uncomfortable with. Yeah. Now you don't necessarily have to agree with this, those conclusions, but then all of a sudden people turned on MK. MK has done some immaculate work uh, with this film, and no, I don't agree with him on everything either. He, he he's a friend, but I don't. We don't. We're not going to agree on everything, and I certainly don't agree that we can make a judgment call on any certain theories because of what may or may not have happened that day. But to me, that's where the end of the discussion normally is. Is right there because, as with anything else, look at it, use your own eyes, your own brain. If you if you can't, if you're constantly listening to people analyze it, nothing in is going to be ever going to be real except patty so sure. you can learn things from them but don't don't make up your let the, don't let them make up your mind for you look use your own brain you, you, that's what you have one for uh a little something funny uh i think it's funny when i first started sharing research online and youtube and things like that of course i didn't really show my face any it's mostly my voice uh you know, I can't shock people with my big ogre nose and all that stuff right off the bat. I had to break it in slowly. But a lot of people thought that M.K. Davis and I were the same person. They thought we were the same. Uh, they thought that it was M.K. using another profile or something like that. And I said, no, no, it's not. We're not the same dude. <laughs> you know what it might have been, though, but to be honest with you? I remember some of those, some, some of those older videos and you also would say now and again you would thank people for their time oh, and i'll I, bet you know what i think that might because mk is uh, as far as i know to this day still thanks people for taking the time to watch by saying i thank you for your time you used to do that there's you have old videos where you did that and i think <laughs> that that might have had something to do with that, it that might have <laughs> oh, that's funny but, uh, yeah, I always thought it was kind of funny that they thought I was M.K. Davis. I have no idea what the next picture is. Oh, this is a, a little movement gif. I'll move that in. Uh, let's talk about the movement. How, how fluid uh, do you think the movement is with this? For a 1967 suit, 
that's awful fluid if it, you know if people say it, say it is a suit uh, to be walking through rough terrain. Well, we know it's been said a million times by a million people. The technology was not there in 67 by the best costume makers in Hollywood <laughs> to pull this off. I got some pictures of that too. So. However, you have to look at it on the, the, the other side too because like I said, the skeptics are a good thing. Uh, they're scumbags and, and lousy people on both sides. So sometimes... You know, having skeptics to, to, you know, bounce things off of and stuff like that can be a good thing. So there are decent arguments on both sides, but, uh, you know, to move like that in everything that was supposed to be, be involved in this costume, <laughs> man, oh man, that would take some practice over and over and over again and even then i don't think it could be pulled off and of but course there are some questions about uh roger patterson's character uh people say he was kind of a i guess a shady guy or whatever uh or, or whatever but that don't take away from i don't think it takes away from the footage uh, that don't mean he was uh that he faked the footage just because maybe he's not a nice guy sometimes well i mean you look at certain certain other films and and things like that the what matters is the film itself i don't care if you know the biggest ass in the world gets a good film i, I don't care if i like the guy or not i want to like the film yeah. that's what matters i just, yes i, I the, their their personality and their you know how they are that's going to come up in the backstory if the person you know, actually knows it because that's what people in the Bigfoot world do. But if you're just going to study the film and, and talk about the film, I can, o I can, I can only go by the first adult female that I saw. And the main difference was the one, the, the adult female that I, the first, the first adult female that I saw was basically Patty with love handles. She had a little more weight going from her back down to her thighs Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I had I had no and uh, the videos that analyzed it and stuff like that didn't mean anything to me. What meant something to me was the first adult female that I saw. Now, this video may end up we may find out someday that it was somehow they got lucky. They made it, it's a homemade suit. They got lucky. Things just happened to flex when they were supposed to flex. We may find that out someday. But if I'm going by what I've seen with my own two eyes, it's her with with love handles. So uh, that so that tells you which way, obviously, that I lean with with this film. But I do not believe one word of the story, and I and that that has nothing to do with anybody else's theory. I just have never. There's something that sets wrong with me about this about the story, but the film itself. Mm -hmm. uh, Looking at a female Sasquatch there. <laughs> uh, let me uh, let me address this question too. Uh, the Stefford Wives is asking about uh, hair samples. I have hair samples. I have two hair samples. One came out of a, a juvenile track casting, and where did the other one come? I can't remember where the other one come from. Uh, having a hair sample to extract DNA is about as useless as as as, as it gets because there's nothing to compare it to until you have a established species in the dna bank to compare it to your dna samples are useless you're just you're just sending off a, a higher sample uh that's going to come back uh most likely a primate and unknown that's what it's going to be and uh, that's the best that it can come back and that's the best it can come back because it's close to a human but it's not a human and we have nothing on record to compare it to so uh, all this getting the higher samples and stuff is just it's just useless uh, you're sending them in. Uh, there's nothing to compare it to. The whole That's DNA what... thing right now, and it's not because we're taking shots at people that have done it. The whole DNA thing right now is, is sure, if you have it and you want to collect it, go nuts. But there, there's no 
there's nothing there to compare it to, like Tom said. So DNA testing in Bigfoot right now are not they're not meshing because you know it, the best the best it can come back is 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 unknown and uh, as soon as it comes back as unknown, that's when everybody jumps in and says, "Well, that doesn't mean it's Bigfoot," and they're absolutely right. As of right now, it doesn't. You're not going to prove anything with a hair sample uh, nope. at this point. Uh, I've got hair samples. Uh, actually, I did a, a live video on one, uh, one of the samples that actually it came from a track casting too, if I remember correctly, it did. Uh, and it is part of it is clear. It's uh, it just is almost like I guess you could call it like glass or something. Uh, really, I guess if you want to compare it, it's more like a polar bear's hair which is going to uh, absorb the light around it and it has some brown tips on it. Uh, so having a higher sample for DNA, which it, it sounds good and a lot of people uh, like that, it, there's nothing to compare it to. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an unknown species to science, so there's nothing in the data banks to actually confirm that it's Sasquatch. So you would have to have a, a, a confirmed Sasquatch body first in the record to compare it to so anybody who's sending in dna dna samples are most likely just wasting their sample at this point uh i don't know if anyone heard of anyone claimed to have found bigfoot scat do either of you know of such report yep plenty of them there's but the problem is is that it can be a big pile of scat and but unless you watch bigfoot do it then you can't really say it's it's another there's no there's no real way to test so yes there's been people that have have found it uh, found what they think is is bigfoot scat and everything but again it's a matter of opinion yeah uh well i found some stuff that could possibly have been bigfoot or bigfoot used the bathroom but it could also be a uh could have been a bear too because you know they're eating they're eating basically the same things uh, in the forest uh, if me and you lived in the forest for any period of time our bowel movements would look very similar to <laughs> to a bear's or possibly a bigfoot and uh some claim that maybe they even bury their their poop uh, and that's possible but uh, that's not a i wasn't going to bring it up but becca just ratted on me yeah uh, <laughs> Well, I've always kind of thought well, that, that they possibly do. So, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll throw this out there as a question: What if they use logs or branches, lean back on them, have their bowel movement into a hole that they've taken the heel of their foot and dug, sat down, did their business, filled it back in, gone. Just what if? I'm not. I'm not saying. You know, I'm just saying what if. Well, well also you think about this too. Uh, a lot of times, our domesticated dogs or cats or whatever, they'll have a specific area that they like to use the bathroom. Who says that Bigfoot doesn't have a specific area they like to go use the bathroom? And you know, what's the chances if you, and especially if it's something they bury or. Uh, what's the chances if you find it? It's going to be going to be slim. But, but I'd say sometimes there's uh, cases where they don't bury it because of uh, maybe they're in a hurry or they're just young and stupid or whatever. Well, that I mean depends on the if they have time to to do to do, to bury it and stuff like that, of course. But I mean, they, yeah, there's going to be times where they're on the go, on the go. So there's been a lot of good questions in the uh, chat tonight. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, and. There's no, uh, I won't say, there's no dumb questions or anything like that. To me, there's not. Uh, there's some questions that are hard to answer for me because I don't know. Uh, but I can take a, uh, a educated guess due to my experience of being out in the woods and things like that. Uh, yes, omnivores for sure. Uh, eat what, I like to call them opportunists. Uh, <laughs> they'll eat anything they can, they can get. <laughs> So, if it's edible and they can get uh, nourishment out of it, then they Correct. know what they can eat and what they can't. Do. I mean, the same way that that we probably find out, and you know, we find out we're allergic to something, we don't eat it again. If they 
do the same, they probably catch on too. So, well, speaking of which, uh, I did a post today on our blog about the Carolina parakeet, which was a native uh, parrot species here in, well, as far as Colorado, Kentucky, uh, Florida. And what was unique about it that it was poisonous if you ate it. Many cats and stuff ate it and died, and it was because of what it ate. He he ate a seed. I think it was called a cuckleberry seed that was highly toxic and that toxicity would go into its body didn't hurt the bird but if anything ate the bird it would it, it, they would die <laughs> so if you've not checked out that the little article uh check it out uh i wrote that this morning and i've had it on my mind for a while uh, they're thinking about they sequenced the genome for this parrot that's been extinct since like the 30s and they're thinking about bringing it back, which I think would be awesome because it was mostly humans that caused it to go extinct to start with, with uh, deforestation and, uh, you know, growing cities and cutting down trees and habitat and things like that. How much do you think a baby Bigfoot weighs at birth? I don't know. I don't, well, I don't have, if it would depend on the size. It would depend on the size of... I, mean, I, don't, I don't think there's any, there's any standard way of doing that, but I mean, obviously, if they have a, a seven foot mother and that their body structure and everything like that, they're going to be somewhat bigger. I've seen ones months old, but I have I've never you know newborn is and I don't think anybody's going to see a you know newborn newborn. Uh, they're not going to be anywhere near our viewing. Well, then you think about stuff like maybe the kangaroos. When the little baby is born, it's really small. I mean, it's tiny, tiny, but it grows real fast. So, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I don't really know. Uh, would you say it would possibly comparable to a large human baby? I'd say so. Yeah. I, well, yeah, that's kind of the way I look at it. I mean, yeah, you, with us, things, are, things like that are, are proportionate unless they're born you know, young or ill or whatever. So yeah. I figure it'd be about the same with them. Uh, this is a, another still frame. Uh, evidently it's been enhanced a little bit as far as uh, color, uh, where you can actually see the breast a little bit better and you can see the face a little bit better. Uh, what I find interesting about this particular portrait, or this picture rather, is how the hair in areas are is heavier and thicker in areas and wore uh, possibly wore off in other areas. Maybe it's from the swinging arms, which causes it to uh, maybe wear off a little bit in spots. I know uh, for me, uh, like wearing a pair of jeans, which I know Bigfoot don't wear jeans, uh, it'll wear the hair off certain spots in my legs because of where it rubs. Uh, even your arms will do that in certain areas if you if rubs if you're fat like me and it rubs your sides. Or it could just be a natural uh, a thing, how the uh, hair grows in. A Leo might be better to answer that than, than I. Well, I know when they show them on TV, they, they go to one extreme or the other. Like if it's a Bigfoot horror movie, like one of the really cheesy Bigfoot movies, yeah. then they'll, they, they tend to have them with hair more patchy and stuff like that. But when you look at the Bigfoot TV shows and they show you the the CGI version, that it's a wonderfully groomed same length of hair all over the body. I've yet to see that. I've What I've seen is longer hair here, shorter hair, hair there, longer hair, longer in certain spots. I've seen long, long hair on, on a Sasquatch, and I've seen hair that was no longer than that. So... Um, this to me, this is a good thing. To others, they look at it as well. The hair should all look the same. No, that's what they're showing you on TV with CGI models. That the hair all over the body is not uniform. It, it's I've never seen that. Well, now the big one I've seen here close to home, uh, I'll estimate it at roughly ten foot tall. His monster. Hits back was what I've seen the most, and hit. Uh, would have had appeared to be real shiny black uh it didn't look like it had uh you know like any patches missing or uh 
but this was in the winter time so maybe it gets a little thicker in the winter time i don't know uh and probably not as bug bite don't have bug bites or ticks and things like that maybe neither but it was very dark and shiny and uh i wish i would have been closer but i it was i wasn't expecting to see the bigfoot at that time uh but when you see it, I just kind of froze because I wasn't looking for Bigfoot. You know, it's kind of like if I get a mouse in the house, uh, you'll probably find me uh, with my feet up in the chair. But if I'm out in the woods and I see a mouse, it's no big deal because I know that's the potential. It should be out there, a mouse, but it shouldn't be in my house. So, uh, you know, I, when I was looking for uh, out looking for Bigfoot, it's not as shocking to see one. But when you're not looking for a Bigfoot and you see it, and then you're just kind of dumbfounded there for a few seconds to you gather yourself. And and uh, I was going to comment on how Patty moves. Uh, the big this Bigfoot I saw, uh, unobstructed view, it moved much faster than what Patty is moving in the film. Uh, it just it was just silky smooth movement. Uh, in just a few seconds, it had. I, I took it that it went down on all fours and behind some small trees that still had some brown leaves on it from the winter and over into a ravine where I couldn't see it and it was gone. Uh, but it was just amazing to see it move so fluid. Uh, even though Patty does move real real smooth, uh, the one I seen moved uh, much faster, but the one I seen was, I'm pretty sure it was a male. Yeah, she's not doing the glide thing. She's not doing the glide walk thing. She's uh, as like you said, she does move very uh, move very smooth. Say that ton, ten times fast. Uh, she does move very smooth, but uh, it's she, yeah. I know what you mean. She doesn't have that just automatic glide kind of thing to her. Well, I'm glad you can. I mean, you've not really talked a whole lot about that. I'm glad you could confirm that. Uh that gliding smooth motion it's just unreal to see oh if they're walking around like if they're walking by and you can you get a decent view you would swear that they're moving their arms but yet they were on a uh, uh well you know those things in the escalator but not oh, but, yeah. but, the, but the flat ones they have at the airport so smooth so, yeah yeah it as if as if they were it, it was they're so smooth that they look like they could be standing on that and just swinging their arms. Uh, well, there it is. <laughs> this is the uh, uh, Morrison Costume Company. This was their uh, proof that they made the costume for Patty. Uh, as you can see, not only can you see the guy's tennis shoes, uh, <laughs> you can also see the bags and wrinkles in the suit notice the wrinkles in the side here and uh, while the face looks fairly decent i think the face looks pretty good but you can see this is a wrinkly old suit and remember they made this well, several years later and they took credit for uh for making the suit that patterson used supposedly uh my my whole thing about that is is that if they actually did make a suit they would be selling the suit like hotcakes nowadays because everybody in the movie industry would want one uh they would not have threw away the pattern if they actually did make the suit and uh, they would be like i say they would not have stopped selling them they would have been selling them more and more uh but I don't think that they actually made the suit. I think they were just maybe trying to get uh, attached themselves to something that was famous to get more people to their website. Well, what never made any sense to me about Morris and Hieronymus teaming up, Hieronymus preached for years that it was a homemade rig, that that uh, the whole horse hide thing and all that. Then mm -hmm. Philip Morris comes along and he says, well, no, no, no. I sold him the suit. He was watching TV with his wife and said, that's my gorilla suit and all that mumbo jumbo. And then him and Bob Hieronymus. Uh Oh, uh, something happened there. We lost everybody. Uh, if you can still hear me in the chat, please let me know. I don't know what caused a little hiccup there. 
Are you there, Leo? No, oh, yeah, I was here the whole time. What happened? I don't know. You were just on the screen. Okay, well let's let's see. And, if I, we just, can and I just wasn't. I don't know. It might may, may just click back off for a minute. Let's let's get that picture back up. It won't take just a second. Uh, there we go. But either way, I mean, the two contradict their own story that they tried. They got together and teamed up to try and pull this whole thing, but they contradicted one another's story so bad that it wasn't worth. It wasn't even worth the the, the time that the little bit of time I took reading about it, like ten well, fifteen thing years ago. Bob, the thing with Bob also was that I think he would wanted to get in on. He thought there was a lot of money involved in it. Uh, you can actually go on eBay now and find where he has signed pictures of Patty, uh, the film, you know, still frame. And the last I seen him, they was going for like $85 a pop. Uh, the guy who played Patty. Uh, so I think he was in on the, uh, I think he was in on wanting to get, make some money. Well, who knows? Uh, he, we know that, that, they used one of his horses and yeah he could have been promised money for for you know that or uh, some some work on on the project the film project that Roger was work, working on and as much as people don't want to hear it it's very possible that Roger Patterson was not a very trustworthy guy but that doesn't take away what's in the film And now we've lost Tom.